Y'all doing good this morning? Amen. Even if you're not, I'm glad that you made it to church. Amen. 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 That's good. Praise God. Good to have everybody here. I know, hey, look, I know that life has some definite speed bumps along the way. But praise God. Listen, that's how we learn to, to persevere. You know, that's how we learn uh, to to endure through the trial. Is to is to even in the midst of the trial. See, we want a lot of times we want God to 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 make everything go away. But the reality of it is, is that many times God doesn't take everything away. God teaches us though to trust Him through the fire in the midst of the trial to believe that He will and can deliver us. Amen. And to give us the grace that we need to keep on going. Because really, listen to me, I'm telling you, I hope you can believe me when I tell you this, that this journey and this life is not just about, uh, you know, how big our houses are, how pretty our cars are, and what, nothing like that. Really, this journey has to do with, in the end, I mean, listen, if God is real and he went through all of that and sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that you and I could become his children, amen, and we could gain eternal life, then really what this temporary part of life is about is learning to walk with him. Are you convinced that God is real this morning? Amen. I hope you are. But if you're convinced that God is real and you're convinced that Jesus is the way, then I got to tell you that God many times allows certain trials in our life, certain situations to take place. Why? To give us the opportunity to exercise our faith. Amen. And listen, whenever you whenever you're in school, I know a little bit about school. It, for a while there, it looked like I wasn't going to know too much about school. But, hey, I learned a little bit about school. And, and you know, and going, one, of, one of the things that I learned was this. Preparation. Studying for a test is a big deal. Because once it comes test time, you will be evaluated on your knowledge of whether or not you knew. So I'm using that as an analogy to describe the fact that walking, believing God is going to be tested. You, you, you know, I, I look at, I, I remember the scripture where, where, G, where Jesus was tempted, the passage of scripture where Jesus was tempted, tested, however you want to look at it, for 40 days in the wilderness. The enemy himself tested our Savior. And, and, and listen to me, it was bad. Don't think that it wasn't bad because the word of God says that the angels came and had to minister to, the, to our Lord. He walked upon this earth and he, he proclaimed that he was the son of man, which meant he was the answer for fallen man and that he was also the son of God. But the enemy tested him in that. You and I walk this earth and we call ourselves Christian, which the idea means Christ-like. If you and I don't think that we're not going to be tested, and sometimes in a very heavy way, then you got Christianity, you, you have a misunderstanding of what Christianity is. So I just want to encourage you this morning, and this isn't really my message, but I want to encourage you this morning and let you know that if you're going through things, you're not alone. If you're facing trials and struggles, you're not alone. And it's important that we understand that because many times we can, we, and, and then sometimes the enemy will whisper in our ear and he'll say, man, you're, you know, look at your hard times you're going through and nobody even seems to care. Can I, I don't mean to be rude, really. I, the Lord has toned my personality down quite a bit. I don't mean to be rude, but newsflash, that you're not the only one going through stuff. Everybody in this room this morning is facing a trial in their life of some sort. Did you hear that? Newsflash. You're not the only one going through things. All people in Christ, all the people of the body in the body of Christ are facing trial and tribulation. And we all need the grace of God flowing in our lives to strengthen us, to encourage us, to heal us. Amen. And if we will trust God, he will do that very thing. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if that was very encouraging for you, but that was the truth. So I hope it encouraged you. Amen. All right. Let's go to John chapter 4, verses 25 through 42. The Lord put this message on my heart uh, about the fact that the harvest is white. Amen. Let's pray. We're going to, uh, I'm not, not let's pray. Let's read. Verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh. 
which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto you am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him or begged him or asked him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat or brought him anything to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reaps, receives wages, and gathers fruit unto eternal life. That both he that sows, and he that reaps, may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him. They besought him that he would tarry with them or stay with him, them. And he abode there for two days. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So I want to, for, for just a little short period of time, I don't think this will be a long message. We're going to take communion. I want to minister to you again. The title is, The Fields Are White and Red. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be a vessel used by you, simply a mouthpiece to speak forth your word. So, Lord, I pray that you'd move me out of the way and that you would use me as a vessel, Lord God, and that you would speak this morning exactly what you desire for your congregation to hear, Lord God. Your people called by your name, Lord. You are their God. You are their shepherd. And I pray that you would lead and guide them, Lord God. And once again, that you would flow through me and that your word would be anointed, Lord God, and that it would accomplish that which you set it forth to do. It will will not return into you void because that is your word, O Lord. We give you glory and honor this morning in Jesus' name. We pray. Hey, listen, this story has a lot of context before it. To be perfectly honest with you, typically I have probably preached this story, well, I don't even know how many times, but I've never preached this part, never focused in on this last part that I can remember. Usually it's always on the life of this Samaritan woman. But just to, real quickly to get you up to speed on what went before, it starts off in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, both Jesus and John the Baptist are baptizing in the Jordan River. And then all of a sudden, something starts happening. I'm going to draw a map for you while, while I'm talking. Something starts to happen. People start to take notice of the fact that, you know, because John the Baptist's ministry was exploding. You know, uh, people were coming out into the wilderness to hear him preach. Because the Word of God said that he was called from his mother's womb to be the fulfillment of the one who would cry in the wilderness and prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so what John the Baptist was, what was came before Jesus and was preaching in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance to prepare the people's hearts for when Messiah would finally show up on the scene. Amen. And, and, and so he's been preaching and the crowds are coming out to him. 
And they're they're receiving Jesus Christ. They're they're they're, they're I'm, I'm sorry. They're they're uh, receiving this baptism of repentance, and they're being cleansed of their sin. And it's preparing the way for Jesus to begin his ministry. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. John the Baptist explains one day, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." And when he did that, everything changed. Everything transitioned. As a matter of fact, two of his disciples left John and connected themselves to Jesus. That's how it all started. But in this, but in chapter three, what's happening is that people are starting to recognize the fact that you know Jesus's ministry is growing. That his disciples are uh, bat beginning to baptize more people than what John's disciple than what John's baptized. Now, John's response is that I must decrease so that he might increase. Don't you know that that is the, supposed to be the true heart of every believer? That you and I, unfortunately, many times in ministry, I'm just, I'm just using ministers as an example. Why? Because John the Baptist theoretically was a minister of the gospel. Many times ministers, they elevate themselves. They want to be elevated. People, even in the kingdom of God, want to elevate themselves. Typically, people don't want to take the lower position, especially in this American mindset that we have. We want to be elevated. We want to get what we have coming to us. How many times have we not felt that in our heart? Whenever people have done us wrong, we want, I, I use it, the analogy sometimes, we want our day in court. We want to be Justified. We want everybody to know that we were right and that the other person was wrong. We want to be elevated and we don't want to decrease and lower ourselves. But I got to tell you that that's not the heart of the Lord. Right. And if the same spirit that raised him from the dead now lives on the inside of you, there should be some change going on on the inside of your heart. If that doesn't sound right to maybe somebody out there watching on video, I got to tell you, that's the spirit of the Christ. That's the spirit of Messiah. And who, that's who she was talking about. See, the spirit of Messiah, how do you know what you're talking about, preacher? Because that's exactly what he did. That is what he did. He lowered himself to the point of death on the cross so that he could serve you, or, you and I. He said the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to others and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. The whole life of Jesus the whole point to Jesus was to minister to you and I to selflessly, sacrificially. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you that that attitude is not birthed in our hearts overnight. It's just not. But with time, if we'll trust God, if we'll learn of his ways, he will teach us humility. But this is the beauty of it. Oh, preacher, now it sounds like you're trying to tell me I just need to let people walk all over me. No, what I'm telling you is. You need to trust God. You need to trust that God will vindicate you. You need to trust that God will protect you. You need to trust that he is your victorious warrior and that you don't have to fix every single situation that you find yourself in the midst of. I'm here to tell you that if you'll trust God, he'll take care of you. And that is the journey. And that is part of the struggle. The fields are white and they are red. So again... John the Baptist says, I must decrease so that he might increase. Now, one of the things that I want to tell you, though, is, and then the Pharisees start coming around. And they're like, oh, and, and the word of God says that when Jesus realized that the Pharisees knew that they were baptizing more than John, then you know what Jesus does? He does what he does. And he leaves the scene. Because you know what? To be honest with you, Jesus, what, there, when it was right time, Jesus would confront them. He, he called those religious leaders. He said, you're of your father, the devil. He speaks lies. And that's all you know how to speak because your father was the liar from the beginning. So when it was time to confront, Jesus would confront him. Don't, don't give me this Jesus that would never stand up for what was right. Don't give me this Jesus that was so. No, no, no. D Jesus was meek. You know what meek means? And the word of God says the meek shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness describes the fact that you have the power that is that is beyond what, what you can even understand, but it's controlled. 
That means that whenever somebody does you wrong, even though you could, I mean, I'm just, this is a poor analogy because we're in church and why would we be talking about fighting? But I'm just using it as an example. That somebody did you dirty and you could just totally whoop them up one side and down the other. I'm talking about leaving them up in a bloody mess. But because of the self-control of the Holy Spirit that is in you, you're not going to do that. Meekness is not weakness. Listen, whenever they came for Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, whom do you seek? They were behind him. He knew that they were there. Whom do you see? We seek Jesus of Nazareth. This is what he said in the Greek. I am. And when he said that, he turned out, fell down under the power of God. But at the same time, he let them take him and put him on the cross so that he could die for you and die for me. That's meekness. That's not weakness. That's like the power that's on the inside of a stallion that has finally been broken and now he can be used by his master. Jesus. See, because if you got all that raw power and you refuse to be broken by your master and you refuse to surrender to God, then now, guess what? God can't even use that. You got all the potential in the world, but God can't use it because you instead choose to serve yourself. So anyway, this is what Jesus does because he's meek, not weak. He leaves and he goes towards this region called Galilee, which is actually kind of where he was. Well, that's where he was born up here in Nazareth around the Sea of Galilee. So this is the Jordan River and they're baptizing probably somewhere around here. And this is the Dead Sea. OK, but I want you to see something right here. There was a spot, a place called Samaria in between. I'm just real quick going to break this down for you. Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about this, but the Samaritans and the Jews had a very deep dislike for one another. It's way too deep for us to get into. It's various reasons why it would take too long to try to break it down. You just got to understand that this was racial tension at its worst. They did not like one another. They actually hated one another. The Jews down here felt they were superior. They felt like the Samaritans had like their, their understanding of God was all mixed up. They only read a portion of the Bible. They didn't believe King David was of any significance. So therefore they did not understand the concept of Messiah. You remember how she said, we know Messiah comes. Well, her idea of Messiah was different than what Messiah really was because they didn't even believe in, in all this, all the writings that re resulted about King David and most of the prophecies that talked about Messiah were connected to King David. So she had an incomplete understanding. That's why Jesus told her, you Samaritans don't even know what you worship. Salvation is of the Jews. See, the reason that Jesus said that is because Ju Judea is another way to say this word Judah. Judah was the tribe of Judah. From, tri from the tribe of Judah came King David. From King David came Jesus, Messiah, the Savior of the world. All right. But so in order to get from Jud Judah to Galilee... If you came through here, which is the easiest route, you'd have to go through Samaria. Well, these Jews hated the Samaritans so much that the normal route would be this. They would cross over the Jordan and they would go through the land of Perea. And then whenever they got close to Galilee, they cut back across just so they could miss Samaria. What I want you to know is, is that in this passage of scripture, though, this whole story hinges on John chapter 4, verse 4. I want you to go ahead and put it up there because I want you to put your eyes on it. Because I need you to understand that whatever you're going through this morning, you need to know that this is how God feels about you. Amen. It says right here, and he, talking about Jesus, must, needs, go through Samaria. Let's just say that again. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now listen, when you study this out in the, in the original language and when you read behind commentators and scholars alike, the idea behind here is this. He was being compelled. He was being compelled to go through Samaria. He was being compelled not to do what the norm was to do, not to not to go the route that man goes. But right. instead, right. he was compelled to go right here. Now, we don't really know why he's compelled until he shows up on the scene. Yeah. 
And when he shows up on the scene, he finds that his disciples have gone into town to find some food. Hence the word meat, M-E-A-T. In the King James language, the word meat just simply means food. Okay, and it, that, that's just it's an outdated way of using the word meat. But so they go into town to get some meat or to get some food. And Jesus goes to the well and he finds a woman, a Samaritan woman alone at the well. And he begins to have this conversation with her and he even asks her, hey, can you get me some water? And she's just blown away because, see, you got to understand the context to really appreciate it. First of all, a Jewish man would not be having a conversation with a Samaritan. You got to understand that. That's why they didn't even want to go through this land right here, because they felt like the Samaritans were unclean. And Jewish people that, that touch something unclean can't go to the temple to worship God. That's how bad it was. That's how superior in their, and hypocritical that they were in their religion. OK, and, and then in addition to that, I, I just this is kind of like weird, but it is what it is. There's there's evidence that Jewish people believe that Samaritans and specifically Samaritan women were so dirty that they were menstruating all the time. N that's not true. I mean, come on, a whole race of women. But, but this is the but this is the problem. A menstruating woman, according to the law, was unclean and anybody near her. Touching her would be considered unclean, unclean for seven days. And then you can't go to the temple again. You can't worship. So the idea behind all of this, that's Old Testament law. It was all spiritual types that showed the fact that mankind was was not clean, but that Jesus and the blood was here to make clean. We don't have time to get into Leviticus and to also show you the types of the cross that are in the Old Testament that would say a woman was that was menstruating was unclean, but also would turn around and give you a type of the cross, whether it was with the turtle doves and, and, and the blood being put into the water and then you being sprinkled with it. You see what I'm getting at? I'm just trying to say God was all about preparing the way to show us the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified even thousands of years before Jesus would come. Anyway, he finds himself at this water pot and she's blown away. She's like, why would you ask of me, a Samaritan woman, something to drink? <clears throat> And, 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 and he, 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 she actually goes on to say, how are you going to get the water? You don't even have a vessel. And he said, well, you give me a drink. And then, but then he turns around and he tells her, but if you knew who I really was, mm -hmm. you, would, you would ask me of the living water that I can give you because anybody that takes, partakes of my living water will never thirst again. Oh, yeah. Now, her mindset, I'm going to tell you, was wrong. Because in her mind, when you read it, the idea is, oh, give me some of this living water, she says. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, is that it doesn't seem like she wants the living water to quench her spiritual void, to quench the appetite that is on the inside of her. Instead, what she wants is she doesn't want to have to go to the water and hole anymore. She wants life to be made easier. Come on, church. Many times people walk through the doors of a church. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a good reason to show up in a church, but if you stay there for 20 years, then you're not getting fed what you need to be fed. Many times people walk into a church and they want their life to be better. They want their life to be easier. Instead of seeking Jesus, they're seeking something that is going to make their life better and make them feel better. But I'm here to tell you that what the gospel teaches is that Jesus came to heal you of your sin, to heal you of your disease. And if you will allow him to do such a thing, then hallelujah, your life will begin to get better because he will begin to swerve you off the road where you're going. That's causing all of the destruction, all the mayhem, all the heartache. And he will begin to bring you to a place where he can bring healing to you. Amen. Amen. And so that's the story. She's like, well, I want some of this water. And then he, then she tries to flip the script on him real quick. And she wants to start talking all theological. Well, where are we supposed to worship? Your people say we worship here. My people. And you know what Jesus does? Now, you know, you'll have people that argue over this. But what Jesus says is, go get your husband. He, just, he doesn't even answer. You know, he, he kind of deals with her a little bit. But then he says, well, I'll tell you what. Go get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, well, this you say is true. You don't have a husband. You've already had, if I'm not mistaken, five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. 
But people will be like, surely Jesus wasn't doing what it sounds like he was doing. No, of course he was. Because, see, the problem with mankind is sin. And sin, why is sin the problem? Because sin separates us from the presence of God. But hallelujah, he came to make a way that we could be reconnected to God. What are you saying, preacher? Uh, That anytime I mess up, anytime I fail, anytime I sin, now I'm disconnected. Now I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the bridge that brings you back to God. And that even though you make mistakes, even though you fail God, even though you still commit sin, hallelujah, God will forgive you in Christ. The blood of Jesus continuously washes you and cleanses you and that's how you're made right in your walk with the Lord but listen at some point in time as you walk more and more with God you're going to get more and more cleansed you're going to get more and more free your desires of your heart will begin to get changed that's if you continue to serve God I don't mean to get off of my message, but that's if you continue to serve God. Let me say it again. That's if you continue to serve God, like in the message I preached on Wednesday night, with the, with the Lord before you and the world behind you. But listen to me, brothers and sisters. If you're still eating at the table of the world, and you're feeding yourself the nutrition of the world, and you think you're going to get more holy and godly and more righteous, and that your walk is going to start looking more like Jesus instead of, that doesn't even even make any sense. No. If you eat the food that the world offers, whatever that looks like, I ain't even got to break it down because the Holy Spirit's telling you right now exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm talking about if you're going to keep on eating at the table of the world and keep consuming the food that they tell you is good for your soul, then you're going to keep on looking like them, keep on acting like them, and keep on feeling the heartache and the pain that they offer. Because this world has fallen and mankind has fallen. But I got good news for you. If you'll belly up to the table of the Lord and you'll start eating the meal that he's cooking for you and you'll start feeding yourself that nutrition, I just believe in God that he's going to get you through this and that he's going to strengthen you. Will there be some bad days? You better believe it. Will there be some good days? Absolutely. But nevertheless, he's going to teach you how to have hinds feet. He's going to, what does that mean? Like a mountain goat. Yeah. He's going to teach you how to walk. Mm-hmm. In mountainous places with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. He was compelled to go. And so he says, go get your husband. And she said, well, I don't have one. Yeah, well, you, you, you got five. And, and the one that you're living with now is not your husband. So that's where we were in the story when we showed up. She, she said, oh, my gosh, he is the Christ. I got to go tell some folk. Yeah. And his disciples showed up and she left. Right. You know, the idea is that, look, he was compelled to go this particular way instead of the traditional way, because you know what? Jesus breaks the traditions of man Amen. because Amen. man left to himself is self-serving, but not Jesus. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said that this is um, this is part of it is come to seek and to save that which is lost. How does it make you feel when the preacher says you're lost without Jesus? You're lost. Amen. I mean, something nowadays you can't even say that kind of thing in a church because now you're not seeker sensitive. That's the gospel. Jesus said, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That means that you ain't found, brothers and sisters, until you find Jesus. That means that you and I were all born in the same boat and we need Jesus to heal us. Amen. And to make us whole. Even the story where this scripture comes from that I just spoke to you is come to seek and to save the lost. Even in that scripture, it comes and makes the point that I'm talking about because this scripture is in reference to Zacchaeus. Y'all ever heard the story of Zacchaeus? There's old, there's an old uh, children's church song. Uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in that, in that sycamore tree. Why? For the Lord he wanted to see. Because he was short. He couldn't see. And there was a big crowd. But Zacchaeus was like, oh no, I'm about to see Jesus today. Now you got to understand, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And tax collectors were the most hated next to the Samaritans. Because tax collectors were actually of the people of Israel. But yet they worked for the Roman government. And you know what they did was they, they extorted their own people. The Roman government said, this is what you owe Caesar. 
Now you're in charge of collecting the taxes. Whatever you get above and beyond is, goes in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And so they were well known for extorting their own people, for taking from them, and for being just ruthless in their financial dealings. And so they hated them. But yet Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And he said, today, you, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. Get down out of that tree. See, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to save people like the Samaritan woman. He came to save people like Zacchaeus. He came to save people like you and I. The mindsets of religion in that day would have avoided both the Samaritan woman and tax collectors, but Jesus breaks tradition. If you ever find yourself in a church and people are acting all, I hope you don't act snooty and nobody ever walks through these doors. Come on, Christian. Don't you do it. Don't do it. Listen, even if you're having a bad day, look, I'm not trying to tell you to walk around fake. That's not what I'm trying to tell you to do, but try to be, pay attention when you see somebody new and try to be kind enough to make eye contact and at least smile at them because you don't know how hard it is sometimes for people to walk through the door of the church right. in a right. new place in a new environment. Don't do that. It's not right to do that, right? But listen, you walk into some churches. I'm not saying that there's not a, listen, there's some churches that they, they, got, a whole, they got a whole teaching on that. They, they're like over there having a conference on how do you greet people when they come through the door. And I mean, look, dude, they got letters. They get your number. They bake you cookies. They bring it to your house. Look, I don't need you to bake me cookies. Just at least don't scowl at me when I walk in the door. Because I don't want you to be that close to me when I first walk in. You know what I'm saying? I mean, okay. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is this. I'm talking about we gotta, we, we're wanting to work towards something that's genuine. Amen? Amen. That's the tradition of man, though. Many times people are so caught up and they're so hypocritical and whatever and so arrogant that they, that's how they look at people. Why would Jesus consistently break tradition? He heals on the Sabbath. He goes through Samaria. He speaks to a Samaritan woman. Why does he do these things that are so outside of social norms? Because Jesus is only concerned about one thing. Come on, somebody. Ultimately, Jesus is only concerned about one thing. What is he concerned about? He's concerned about, he's come to earth to fulfill his father's will and nothing else will do. Now listen, I can remember when I first started preaching at the other church. I would say, you thought that this was, now this was not, this was novel for me. This was new. This was a new mindset. I was preaching it hard. I had to tell the congregation, you thought this was all about you? You, I, I never probably called him that. My mom used to call me a silly goose when I was a little boy. I still don't even really know exactly what that means. But she's like, you are a silly goose. And I, I think I said that from the pulpit. You are a silly goose if you think that this whole thing is all about you. And then I had somebody come up to me one time after. But, but Brother Matt, I thought it was all about me. All right, that's a pretty good point. Come on. And I said, no, no, buddy, you're right. It is all about you. On the day that Jesus died on the cross, it was all about you. Right. If you'd been the only one to walk this old nasty earth because it was fallen because of the enemy, you'd be the only one that he would have died for. That's how much he loves you, buddy. But he wants you to grow up. He wants you to grow up and he wants you to have the same mind that was in you, that was in Christ Jesus, that though he knew he were God, he humbled himself willingly so that he could become a man, so that he could become a servant, so that he could die the death of the cross because it was the Father's will to save you, to save me. And like I said earlier, if that same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you, hallelujah, it's going to teach you the same thing it was teaching John the Baptist. I must decrease so that he might increase. That's why he does things that are outside of social norms. Because Jesus, again, is only concerned about one thing. He has come to earth to fulfill his father's will and nothing else will do. Now, this is the beauty of that. It gets so deep, right? And we don't have time to really break it down as far as we could go. But look, if Jesus does the father's will and we trust Jesus, then it's still going to be all about us because he is macrocosmically, meaning on a big page, he makes sure all the constellations 
continue to orbit or however that, I'm not an astronomer, however all this stuff is, whatever is orbiting what, the constellations move where they're supposed to move, the moon does its thing, the sun rises and, and goes back to sleep, all at the word of God. Don't tell me that it doesn't. I don't care what the scientist says. The word of God says that he's the one that scattered the stars in the sky. The word of God says he's the one that gave the light of the day and the light of the night. Those planetary bodies obey him. And all of that continues to move in the direction that he tells it to. Uh, amen. And, and he continues to speak and all things continue to exist the way that he plans for it to. But it also goes all the way down to the fact that he says that he knows how many hairs you have on your head. And when he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. How much more, if he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, would he not know also when there's things that are going on in your life? Mm -hmm. And if you and I will begin to believe the way Jesus does, that the most important thing is the Father's will, you and I will begin to see the grace of God working in our lives, strengthening us and changing us. Jesus said this. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added up to you. What other things? Whatever it is that you need for your daily life. Whatever it is that are the desires of your heart. Many times Christians get confused because they take a scripture out of context and they think, oh, it's God's will for me to have this. And then they jump into it. And the next thing you know, they're like, oh, I miss God's timing. I, I thought that this was God's will. This wasn't really God. Oh, you, no, you need to just slow down. And you need to focus on God and his will. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you and teach you on the way that it should go. All right. He's worried about one thing. So here's point number one. You ready? What kind of meat do you eat? <laughs> what point number one, what kind of meat do you eat? Verse 32 of chapter four said this. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So what, what did I tell you meat was? Food. Food. That's right. If we were speaking Spanish, it would be comida, not carne asada. It's food. It's not just a piece of meat. So Jesus said, I have food to eat that you know not of. Now, what does food do? You consume it. What does it do? It breaks down and it turns into nutrition and it gives you energy. It produces an environment where energy can be produced so that you can do work, so that you can move forward in life. The food of Jesus is to do the will of the Father. He's not, talking about, he's not talking about physical food. He's talking about spiritual food. He tells his disciples, because they're like, Master, eat. Has anybody brought him food? We don't understand what's going on. And they're thinking in their head, why is he talking to the Samaritan woman? But nobody bothers to even ask. He says, I have food to eat that you know not of. Then he explains it. My meat, verse 34, is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. This is why Jesus breaks tradition. Because men are more concerned about perception. And what looks cool. Or what seems right. Than they are about God's will. When, you, when we woke, yoke up with God's plan. We will begin to do things out of the ordinary also. We will begin to hear the voice of God tell us that ministry begins out there in the world where people are hurting. In modern churches all across the land, ministry is considered only what is done within the walls of the church. Yes, there is ministry in here, but the purpose of ministry in here is to bring ministry out there, outside of these walls. That's why we teach the truth of the body of, of Jesus Christ, so that you will learn how to access Jesus, and he will be the pastor of your soul. And he, whenever you keep your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, the Holy Spirit will give you the strength that you need in order to grow in Christ, even in bad times, even in dark times, and then God will get you through the valley experiences, and you will be able to minister to other people's lives. Listen, I thank you for cleaning the church. I thank you for teaching the children. I thank you for all that you do. But real men, and, and, because, and, if, and if people don't help, then we can't even have a church. Right, right. But the real purpose of ministry is for us to learn the ways of the Christ, to learn the ways of our Lord, and to take those ways and the change that he's put on the inside of us and for us to bring it, bring it out there. But these disciples, these very men that have been walking with him, they're like, who gave him meat to eat? I don't understand. Jesus is like, no, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Mm. 
See, the same spirit that lived in Jesus lives in us. And when we listen to his word, it will tell us the same thing. I have meat to eat that you know not of. Verse 28. I thought this was interesting. The woman then left her water pot. Think about that. The whole reason that she was there to begin with was to get water in that pot. Mm -hmm. The woman left her water pot. Jesus compelled her to go. She was compelled to tell others about him. What are the activities? And listen, the Lord was speaking to me on this, but I'm going to ask you the same thing. What are the activities that fill your day? Yeah. How much of our lives do we spend on the Lord's work? Meaning, do we study? Do we pray? How often do we tell others about the Lord, about what Jesus has done for us? I got to tell you that God has a plan that people will have an opportunity to live for him. This woman was like the rest of the human race. She needed Jesus and the Holy Spirit made a way for the Lord to get to her. Today, the Holy Spirit wants to use us to get to them. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to use us to get to them. God used Jesus. He, he, he must needs go through Samaria. He was compelled to get to Samaria. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to go there to meet with this one woman. And I got to tell you that today God wants to use you and I as vessels. He wants to compel us to go to those that are hurt. He wants to use us to minister to other people's lives. So that's point number one. What is the meat that you eat? Are you like the disciples? Are you focused on the physical and the temporary and missing the bigger picture of what God is really doing here? Or do we understand what Jesus means when he says, I have food to eat that you know not of. Lord, help us to understand better what it is that you're doing. Second point that I have is the harvest. I just want to talk to you about the harvest for a second. Jesus said this right there. He said, say not ye, there are yet four months and comes the harvest. When you do a little bit of study on this, what you find out is, is that this was a common saying at the time. And it, what it described was the time frame between the sowing of seed or planting of seed and the harvest. Right. So it's a little bit foreign to our mindset because what we do, we just get hop in the car. We go to Walmart, neighborhood Walmart. Mm -hmm. I like neighborhood Walmart personally for me just because it's almost like a convenience store. But I can also get an avocado. For yeah. Right. I walk over there for one avocado. If I want to, it's easy enough. And then instead of getting a Snickers bar, I got me an avocado. I just got to remember to keep a spoon in my car. I know that's weird. But <laughs> better than eating a Snickers bar. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway. We just go to the store, but they were in an agrarian society. What does that mean? They grew. They were agriculture. They grew. And so their, their whole life, their whole world was centered around sowing seed and then reaping harvest. Really, if you go back and you read from the beginning of the scriptures, when God created, he said, until the world comes to an end, there's going to be seed time and harvest. And that's a, that's a physical picture of really what God's plan is spiritually upon this earth. Jesus is making the comment, you say there's yet four months from the time that you put the seed to the time of the harvest. But at the same time, he's saying he, he's about to transition into something else. But I want you to see that God's word is rich with talk about harvest. In his word, God repeatedly describes harvest in reference to the saving of souls or people's conversion towards God and eternal life. Look at Matthew 13, 3. Just looking at a couple of scriptures about harvest. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. What is that talking about? <clears throat> That's talking about a person with seed. And he's going to plant seed in the ground. And this is a parable about the kingdom of God. And then he goes on in verse 23, he says, but he, I, I, I skipped the whole parable just to make a point What God, this is a parable about the condition of the soil and how the seed will grow in the heart. See, the soil is likened to our heart and the environment of our heart affects the way the seed will grow in our heart. And there were, there were three types of bad soil. One was by the wayside. It wasn't even put where it was supposed to be put. One was amongst rocky ground. One was amongst thorny ground. 
And all of those types of ground were hostile to the seed. Meaning, depending upon the condition of your heart, sometimes that condition of your heart can be hostile to the seed of God's word taking root in your life and beginning to bear fruit in your life. Well, the main one I'm, gonna, I'm not even really planning on talking about, but I'm just going to use an example, the third one about the thorns. The thorns represented the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. So you can have this desire towards material possessions or get so caught up in the cares of the world. Oh my God, I'm just saying, like, let me use another example. A single woman. I'm not picking on anybody. This is something that I've learned in the church that women that are single have sometimes a hard time. They, they, they look, they're looking for a man to fill a void and vice versa. A, man, a single man in the church. He's looking for a woman to fill the void. I'm not saying it's not good to get married. The word of God says a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. But what I am saying is this. If you jump the gun and you find yourself a man that is not yoked up with the Lord, Houston, we have a major problem. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he, you are not, the chances of you continuing to serve God when this man is probably going to be trying to pull you away from God are really the odds are not that good. And so when I say the cares of the world, so now we have that situation. Single man looking for a woman. Single woman looking for a man. The cares of the world will now put me in the midst of an environment where the soil of my heart becomes hostile to the seed of God's word. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? See, now I yoke myself up with an unbeliever and everything that he or she brings into my life creates an environment that is hostile for the word of God to have its effect in my life. Now I'm back at the, the table of the world. Now I'm back to eating the food and the nutrition that the world is trying to offer me. And I'm feeding my spirit man with all of that. And it's just going to cause all kind of conflict and frustration in the midst of my life. Do you want to serve God? Do I want to serve God? Then we got to make sure that we understand the decisions that we make regarding that. Verse Matthew 13, 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it. It bears fruit and it brings forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. So various levels to how much fruit it will bring. So when it's a good soil, when our heart is surrendered to the will of God and that word of the Lord finds a good place in our heart and we continue to walk with the Lord, guess what? He, the word of God produces life in us. There might have been a lot of heartache and pain. There might have been times of depression. Listen, again, newsflash, it's not like we all haven't experienced it. I know that I have. I don't know, I'm not going to get into the whole story. I tell you all the story ad nauseum. But we have all felt heartache and pain. We have all felt. I have, I have been on the front line of heartache and pain, my friend. Just, it's just reality. Because the world has fallen and it's full of heartache and pain. Amen? Amen. God wants to bring us, he wants to heal us. And if we will allow our heart to be surrendered to the will of the Lord, he will heal us and he will produce life in us. And then we'll be able to take that life that he's given us and we'll be able to share it with others. See, a lot of times whenever we experience heartache and pain, we're so focused on how it's affecting us that we can't. And listen, early on, that's understandable because we're mourning and we're grieving and it makes sense. But once the, what, at some point in time, the Lord wants to transition that and he wants to use it for his good. He wants to heal us in the midst of our heartache and pain. Why? So that he can bring, he can trust you by bringing someone in your path that you'll now be able to minister to them and share with them what God brought you through, what God got you through. Amen. It wasn't that it didn't hurt. It wasn't that it, that it didn't nearly sometimes destroy people, but whenever we trust God, he'll build us up, he'll strengthen us, and then he'll turn around and he will use us to minister to other people's lives. So in this story, if you'll remember, he said, look, the harvest is white, 
That's the title of my message. I want you to know that it was known that at the time of the barley harvest, the tops of the grain heads would appear white as they glistened in the sun. But the context here is that the seed sown is first from Jesus planting seed about Messiah into the Samaritan woman's life. And then the Samaritan woman sowing seed into the people of her village. And the reference to white is likely them walking through the fields in their white clothes from the village through the field on their way towards Jesus and his disciples. You need to go back and you need to read chapter 4 in the middle where it starts to talk about whenever Jesus is talking at the end of his conversation with her and how she goes back to the village. Because it'll tell you if you go back and you read it more closely. His disciples showed up and they started talking about the food. And then it says, and then at that point in time, Jesus is probably talking to her. And she, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. She's probably sitting there having an epiphany. Like, oh my gosh, this is the Messiah. Yeah. She, I, it doesn't say for sure, but I imagine in my mind, here's the disciples. But master, who brought you food to eat? And she's over here on the backside. Nobody's even paying attention to her. She leaves her water pot. She's like, I got to go to the village. I got to go to the village and I got to tell these people. And then it says, in the meanwhile, she goes over there and then the people start walking back. The word of God tells us that that's exactly what happened. Jesus and his disciples are still there and the people in the village are coming back. Then Jesus says, I, they, I hear they say, yet four months and harvest comes. So that was a common language. Seed sown, then the harvest comes. But I say, look up and see that the fields are white and they're ready for harvest. Seed time and, and reaping harvest. Jesus sowed seed into the Samaritan woman's heart. Something supernatural happened to her. She took what took place on the inside of her heart. She went to that village. She took the seed that had been planted in her. She began to plant it in other people. And listen, she said, I got to tell you that there's a man. Come see this man who told me all that there was to know about my life. Is this not the Messiah? You got to come see. And all of a sudden, all these people start walking towards. And this is what Jesus says. Look, I tell you that the, that the fields are already white unto harvest. And he goes on to tell them that I'm here to, to encourage you to go reap a harvest where you didn't even sow seed. See, his disciples, again, are caught up in the temporary. His disciples, again, are caught up in the physical. And Jesus is like, listen, I sowed seed into her. She sowed seed into them. You didn't even sow that seed. But look, it's coming. It's harvest time. Let's go out into the field and let's do the work. God wants us to be able to see the spiritual and eternal importance of his kingdom. But a world that is focused on the practical and temporary. We often fall prey to follow that path. In this story, the disciples are consumed with temporal matters like physical food. And it's understandable that when we're hungry, we find food and eat. But for Jesus to have answered them that way, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He must have known that their focus was off. Mm -hmm. All of us, sometimes for lack of better words, my dad would have talked like this. And I don't know that preachers are supposed to, but he would have said, sometimes you need a gut check, son. Mm -hmm. Wake you up. Get your focus right. Sometimes we need a gut check from the Lord. Amen. And his disciples needed a gut check. They needed to, to have their eyes open to what was important. The Bible also makes mention that they wondered why he was talking to her, but no one bothered to ask why he was talking to her. Don't you think? I mean, what caused them to do that? Was it arrogance? Was it spiritual superiority? Was it a lack of compassion? We can't really say for sure what it was, but I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. Now, when you walk up on the scene and you see something happening in a situation where people have prejudices and all this racial bias and you see something abnormal you know, wouldn't you at least ask later on? Wouldn't you ask something like, what are you doing talking to her? Because they're full of racial prejudice. They're full of bias. Even people that love God. Until God heals them, my friend, 
Don't expect, listen, you can get a megaphone and you can stand on top of the rooftop and you can tell people, you're not supposed to hate people of different cultural variety. Of course you're not supposed to. We're supposed to love everybody. Jesus died for everybody, but you ain't gonna fix nothing with a megaphone on top of a rooftop. Until Jesus comes back on this earth and spreads the love that he showed when he died on the cross and people's hearts get right because guess what? Them same people, Lord help me, but I'm here to tell you the truth. Yeah. Them same people that will stand on a rooftop with a megaphone and scream about we need to all get rid of racial hate are the same people, many of them, not all of them, I'm not stereotyping, don't put words in my mouth, but many of them are the same people that will say it's perfectly fine to abort millions of babies in this country. And I'm here to tell you that is a lie from the father of lies. Yeah. No, true love, when Jesus comes down and manifests in the heart, is going to get your head right and your heart right on everything. And you might be a rebel. Hallelujah. He deserves glory. You might be a rebel and you might say, well, I don't want to love somebody whose skin's a different color. Well, then you're in rebellion, sir. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think that it's fine that a woman has a choice. No, a woman doesn't have a choice, ma'am. Sorry. You know how you're not the giver of life. I know I keep saying this, but it's really ringing true in my heart. You, woman, are not the giver of life. God is the giver of life. How dare you say you have a choice over someone's life? No, you don't. I don't care what the legislature says. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what anybody says. God is the giver of life, and he's the only one that can take life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, they probably would have been... If they would have asked, why are you talking to her? It would have been a perfect opportunity. Mm -hmm. Jesus would have told them. Mm -hmm. He probably would have told them directly that the Holy Spirit had compelled him to go there because she was hurting. Because she kept trying to walk the same pathway and it was only leading to more heartache. Yeah. How do you know that, preacher? Because she was on her sixth man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, maybe one of them died in war. I mean, okay. You know, maybe two. I don't know. Maybe one of them, maybe even one of them got sick, but if nothing else, he's at least on number three. Yeah. And all I'm trying to say is, is that whenever you keep going down the same path, trying the same old thing, and it's everything but Jesus, you need to try Jesus. Yes. She's hurting and she's in pain, and the Holy Spirit compelled him to go to her. It would have been a perfect opportunity for him to tell him that. And then he would have said, she needed to hear the truth of Messiah. And now look, the seeds that I have planted are already producing a harvest. And look, she sowed seed also. The harvest is white. Go reap what you didn't even sow. Perfect opportunity. <laughs> Something happened to her heart during this encounter with Jesus. It changed her. And she was now compelled to tell others. This behavior is outside of societal norms. Can we not agree? That, I mean, I'm just talking about in society in general. We're a very small world. You won't talk minority. People that truly believe that evangelical Christianity is the right way to go, that is a true, that is a minority. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, that is not, in other words, it's not the majority, right? Mm -hmm. the, even the majority of the church, if you start talking about your personal evangelistic life, they're going to start squirming in their chair. But I'm here to tell you that you read the Bible. How you might squirm in your chair today, my friend. But if you start reading the Bible, you're going to know that this preacher was telling you the truth. That personal evangelism is throughout. That God didn't save the pastor just so that he'd be the only one telling somebody about Jesus. God saves all of us. Wants yes. to fill us up with his Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So that we could also tell others the good news right. about Jesus Christ. But it breaks with societal norms. It's uncomfortable. You ever been, it can be anyway. It doesn't have to be. Oh, no. When the Holy Ghost shows up and he takes over, <laughs> when the Holy Spirit takes over a conversation, it is the oh, most yeah. comfortable, beautiful thing that you've ever seen in all your, you, for redneck terms, all your dearborn days. You ain't never seen nothing more beautiful than that. Whenever you got some people that are antagonistic towards the gospel and the Holy yeah. Spirit shows up and changes the dynamics of the atmosphere. Hold on, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, because the Holy Spirit got a whole bunch of authority that supersedes all that man can bring. And it is a beautiful thing yeah. to experience. 
The rest of society might be moving in a certain direction, but God is saying that the fields are white. Mm. The harvest is ready. Mm -hmm. I want to close with this last thought. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. It's going to seem like this scripture doesn't coincide, but I believe it does. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 says, For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. How does this coincide? Well, I got to tell you. This is talking about Abraham. This is talking about Abraham, you know, 2000 B.C. When God called him out of his father's house and told him, I'm going to make you a great nation. One day he told Abraham, at one night he told Abraham, get outside of your tent. I want you to look up at the heavens. See them stars? Yeah. I see them, God. That's what, your multi that's what the seed, your seed is going to look like is the multitude of those stars. More sand that is on the seashore. How does that work? Because you see, through Abraham came the offspring of the nation of Israel. Through Abraham even came the, the religion of Islam, even though that was not God's will. But more specifically, the ultimate fulfillment of through Abraham came Jesus. Through Jesus came the church. And now all of these descendants... Or of Abraham. The Bible says of Abraham that he was looking for a city. You know what that describes to me? It's kind of like somebody that's just driving. Nope, this city ain't working for me. As a matter of fact, I think he's probably moved on. But the guy that was cutting my hair. I said, man, how many cities you lived in? He, he, he's retired now. He went back to his country. He said, oh, hey, he lived in Miami for a while. He moved to Detroit. He spent some time in California. He lived in New Orleans. He's been in Morgan City for the last 10 years. I mean, dude, you've been to a lot of cities, huh? Can you imagine somebody just not, you know, I don't feel at home in this city. So I'm going to move on to the next city. You understand your picture I'm trying to build for you? Basically, what it's saying is, is that Abraham was on a journey. You realize that? He was traveling. He was like a nomad. Because he never saw the country that God promised him. So he was constantly traveling. But he was looking for a city. See, many times people are looking for a place where they can settle down. Listen, I, I also work in the medical field. And it's very difficult for people to get top-notch doctors in small cities. Why? Because most male doctors or even female doctors, male doctors tend to marry women that are quite bougie, if we could use that word. <laughs> I'm not trying to clown your doctor's wife if she's not bougie. I'm just trying to make a point. They want to go to the opera. I like the ballet. I like ballets. I'm going to be real with you. I, they, 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 they like to go to the opera. They like to go to the ballet. They like their steak butter to sizzle when it hits the plate. I like that too. But I ain't going to make no life determination off of those things. If I got to take a drive, I'll drive to the steakhouse in New Orleans to get my steak once every now and then rather than having to have, to have it right there whenever I can need to mostly be concerned about the things of God. Abraham was looking for a specific type of city, but he wasn't focused on all the niceties that life was going to offer him. What he was focused on, this was the city that Abraham was looking for. And I'm telling you right now, had he found it, he would have known what it was. The city that Abraham was looking for was a city that had as its foundations, whose builder and maker was God. What I'm trying to say is this, is that life offers all kind of temporary circumstances. And God is saying, I need you to look towards something that's bigger. I got a heavenly city, a heavenly Jerusalem is what the word of God says and is being prepared for you even as we speak. The question is, will you believe me at my word? The question is, will you yoke up with me? Will you recognize that the, that the fields are white and ready for harvest? And will you work with me and endeavor to do what it is that I've called mankind to do?
Naya, maybe you and Manny could come forward and we could prepare to take communion. I just wrote in here, Abraham would know when he got there because he knew who the builder of that city was. Again, everyone on this earth is looking for a city and they will travel high and low looking for what their heart desires. But if their travels don't bring them to the city of God, then they will never find what they are really looking for. The last scripture is out of Matthew 9.37. Can I get a communion um, thing? The last scripture is Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Does anybody else need a communion cup? <laughs> the scripture says that the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore. Lord of the harvest, that he will send laborers into his harvest.